feel good? Day one was good? Great, let's have a good day too. Again, it's such an honor to be here and thank you to, to Jeff and Jeff for, for giving me this opportunity to speak to all of you guys. You know, with my company, Think Action, I work with entrepreneurs, young professionals and companies and help them produce exceptional results in their work. And, and prior to that, I worked as a business journalist for many years interviewing top CEOs and, and entrepreneurs. If there's one thing that's been consistent in everything that I do, it's that I am a professional question asker and I am a professional opportunity identifier. That's what I do, that, that is my consistent thread. So based on that being a professional question asker, I have a question for everyone in this room right here, right now. How many of you could use some luck in your life or in your career right now? Who could use some luck? Raise your hand. It's a good portion of the room. I know what it feels like to need a little bit of luck in my life or in my career. Now I'm asking you to go somewhere with me real quick. If you guys would, just for a moment, just shut your eyes for a second, okay? Shut your eyes. And imagine you're in Las Vegas, Sin City, and you enter a casino. It's a really busy, bustling casino. People are walking around, they're, they're betting money on slot tables, blackjack, poker, etc. Then you, you happen to walk by the sports area. And on the wall, you see all the, the games you can bet on, the football games, the baseball games, the horse races. And you happen to see your name on that board. The question I have for all of you right now is, would you bet on you? Would you bet on you accomplishing what you say is most important in your life? The next question I have for you is, would you allow your dear family and friends to spend their hard earned money to bet on you accomplishing what you say and is what is most important in your life? Open your eyes. That's a real question. Now, as you guys know, in Vegas, you can need a little bit of luck. And that's what I'm going to talk to you guys about today, creating your own luck. If you do a background search for me, you Google me on the internet, this is what you're going to find about my background. Over the past 12 years, these are the brands and the companies I've been associated with that I've had the opportunity, the pleasure to work for. I've hosted a business show with NBC. I've created and produced documentary series for BET. You see me report stories on international trade for the news hour. Um, I'm not gonna tell you what I did on Spike TV. Um, <laughs> I've interviewed pop stars on E! News Live. You can read my business articles today in Entrepreneur and Business on Main, MSN Money, et cetera. Now, when, when I look at that right there, and by the way, I started my career hosting shows on, on Nickelodeon, but that's another story. When I look at that right there, that really blows me away. Because if you would have told me just a few years ago, or say when I was in high school, that this would have been possible, that I would have worked for all these companies, that I would have found my way to an Ivy League university, I would have said, what are you smoking? And can you give me some? Because frankly, that's today. Back in 2000, when I arrived in New York City, these were my credits, zero. You see, I'm a guy from Michigan, small town Michigan. I'm, I'm from one of those towns where, where frankly people do not leave. My mother, an executive assistant, has worked for the same company for over 30 years. God bless her. She's not dead when I say God bless her. I just mean she's worked for the same company for over 30 years. Mom, sorry, she's alive. I'm the son of a factory worker. My father has pulled more double shifts in his life than I care to remember. You know, I graduated with a 2.6 from high school. I'm the first person in my family to go to college and to get a degree. So all those things you saw before the slide, technically it wasn't written, it wasn't supposed to happen. But one thing that I've always been, and I'm sure many of you in this room have been, is scrappy. I've always known how to survive. I know what it's like to move over 15 times before you graduate from high school. I know what it's like to be a little bit hungry in the evening and go to bed for sleep. I also know what it's like to live in a shelter for battered and abused women and children. So I've always knew how to survive. For me, surviving has never been a problem. The question was, how could I thrive? 
And the way I went about thriving, and the way I went about creating my own luck is by taking these three steps right here that I'm gonna share with you. So for anyone here who needs to create their own luck, these are three things I want you to take away with you. Number one is get uncomfortable. We talked a bit about that yesterday. Number two, employ what I like to call a walk-on mentality. And number three, ask yourself the most important question, who makes you better? So when I say get uncomfortable, what am I talking about? How many athletes here do we have in the room? Who's been an athlete in their life? Raise your hand. Do you guys know that feeling before the whistle goes off, before the gun goes off in the game, that, that feeling you get in your stomach? If any of you have ever been a public speaker and you got on a stage like this, or even you asked a question at Think Iowa, you know how your heart starts beating a little bit faster before you get to that microphone? Or you get that opportunity for that person you've had that crush on for a really, really long time, and you're like, I'm gonna take this opportunity to say, what's up, girl? How you doing? That's uncomfortable. That feeling in your stomach that you are doing something right. Please do not ever say, what's up, girl? Get uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable right now, and I love it. But that's what I'm talking about, that feeling, the intuition that you know you're doing something right because your heart's beating fast, those butterflies are going. That means you should take that step. So how did I get uncomfortable? What do you do? When you're a dumb kid, or maybe smart, you move to New York City with just $600 in your bank account. That's what I did in the year of 2000. January 2000, moved to New York City with $600 in my bank account. I knew absolutely just one person in New York City. That person was nice enough to let me sleep on their floor for a year. I slept on three couch cushions on a floor for a year. Not a couch, guys. Three couch cushions on a floor. Now remember, we're talking about 2000, okay? This is pre-Facebook, this is pre-LinkedIn, this is pre-Twitter. This is when you had to go up to people, this is when you had to make phone calls. This is when you had to go up to people and shake their hands and actually make an appointment and actually be where you say you're gonna be at eight o'clock. So I had to go about creating my own luck when I got to New York City because I knew no one. And as you guys know, $600 in New York City, that doesn't go very far. I have friends right now that pay $600 a month to park their car. Okay, those are parking spots. So, you saw all those sexy jobs, the NBC, BET, all that stuff. These are the jobs you don't know about. I don't advertise these. Dude, I, I used to sell cheese. I'm not ashamed. I will sell you some Gouda like nobody's business. And you will like it. I was a server at a restaurant. I was hand stuff out guy. You ever been to New York City? Hey, you want this? Hey, take that. Hey, take that. Hey, want this? Hey, comedy night, comedy. I was a hand stuff out guy. I was a temp. Worked in retail for a long time, selling clothes. I was a focus group manipulator, not a focus group participant. A focus group manipulator. Remember, I, I'm scrappy. I knew how to survive. I learned that first focus group that I went to. If I asked, if I answered a question wrongly, I said no. Then I got to go home. I, they, they said, okay, thanks. See you later. So I learned when they asked that question. So, um, who in this room is going to buy a, a driving lawnmower? here in the next year, raise your hand. I raised my hand. Yes, I live in Manhattan in an apartment, but I'm going to drive by a driving lawnmower. Why did I do that? Because I got an extra $20. Focus group manipulator. I'm not ashamed. I was a caterer. I was a photographer's assistant. Guys, listen, there were times that I worked a temp job from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Then I would go work retail at H&M from, from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. in the evening take a little break till midnight, and then from 12 to 3 a.m., I would work as a bar back at a restaurant. A few hours later, I'd begin my day again. Again, I was getting uncomfortable. And you talk about uncomfortable, I used to work with a cow. <laughs> my, first break in the, my first break was co-hosting a show on Nickelodeon, and I worked with a cow. And guess, let me ask you a question. Who do you think made more money? Me or the cow? <laughs> I'm not getting into it, because I'm getting mad right now thinking about a cow made more money than me on TV. So I wasn't afraid to get my hands dirty. I wasn't afraid to get uncomfortable to put the work in. So people always say, Antonio, I speak on college campuses all the time, how did you take that big risk? How did you take that leap to go to New York City with just $600? 
You see, for me, it, it wasn't a leap whatsoever because I've been getting uncomfortable my whole life. You see, after my freshman year of college at Western Michigan University, bless you, after my freshman year of Western Michigan, excuse me, after my freshman year of college at Western Michigan University, I, I went back home and wanted to be like my dad. I worked in a factory. All summer second shift, I did this. Took something like this. You know what's crazy? I still don't know what I made that summer. I was a machine, I was a road bike. Talk about uncomfortable. But I got back to college and I heard about an internship in Detroit that following summer. And if you know anything about where I'm from in Michigan, where we like to, to shoot stuff and go fishing, Detroit for me might as well have been Istanbul. But I got uncomfortable and I ended up in Detroit for an internship that summer. Changed a lot of things. So I came back to campus a little bit cocky. I've, I've worked in a factory, I've been to Detroit, what's next? I remember seeing a, a flyer on campus that said the Walt Disney World College Program. Hmm, who cares that I've never been on a plane and I'm a junior in college, but I flew down that summer and I worked at Walt Disney World down in Orlando. And for the first time, I realized, wow, uh, there's a, a big country out there with people all across the country. Oh, and there's also a world. Did you, guys, did you guys know there's an Atlantic Ocean? A Pacific, I had no idea. So I came back to campus after this experience saying, okay, a factory, okay, Detroit, Orlando, what can I do next? I remember marching to the president's office at Western Michigan University, 26,000 students. And I said, uh, hey man, I wanna study abroad, uh, I need some money. First, just don't say hey man to the president of a university, okay? <laughs> I, hey man, I need some money. He said, okay, he's like, okay, what do you wanna do? I said, I wanna study abroad, I'm going to London. He's like, no you're not. He said, you wanna study abroad? I will give you money if you go somewhere where you can learn a second language. So, where I end up? I end up in the south of Spain. One of the most amazing experiences in my life. So when people say, how did you take that big risk? It wasn't a big risk. For me, it was just the next step. I couldn't have went from small town Michigan to New York City, but because I've been slowly, slowly getting uncomfortable, factory, Detroit, Walt Disney World, Spain, going to New York for me was just the next step. It was no big deal. So the question I have for everyone in this audience right now is, how can you, how can you get uncomfortable today? Is it registering a company, an LLC, or incorporating? Is it buying a domain name? Is it writing a blog post? Is it asking a question today? Is, is it picking up a phone and calling that person that you made an agreement with that you broke, that you, you never rectified? What can you do to get uncomfortable? Can you ask them out on a date? Let me tell you something, breakthroughs come in small steps. People always talk about, oh, you gotta take that big leap. No, you don't. Listen, if you, got some hot, if you got some water on a stove, okay, at sea level, and you got it at 211 degrees Fahrenheit, you got some damn hot water, but it's just still hot water. You turn it up to 212 degrees, it starts boiling. So my question to you guys is, what is that, that, that one degree, that one degree you can turn it up today to get uncomfortable? Think about that. My second step to creating my own luck is, is using what I like to call a walk-on mentality. How many of you guys know what a walk-on is when it comes to sports and, and collegiate sports? For you guys that don't know, a walk-on is basically someone that tries out for a team. I tried out for the track and field team at Western Michigan University. Um, and I was fortunate enough to make it. And I ended up writing a, a book about it, um, Student Athlete 101. But one thing about being a walk-on is that there is nothing guaranteed. At any moment, you can be cut from that team. So what I learned being a walk-on is to employ that blue-collar work ethic that I was raised with, to show up 100% every single day, to never give in. Frankly, I could not take a day off. And there are ways that you guys right now, in the ways that I did in my career, you can employ a walk-on mentality in your life, whether you're starting a company or whether you work at a company right now. Three things you can do. Number one, say yes. How many of you guys have been in that opportunity when you're at work or a job or something like that and the boss comes in and they say, hey, um, I need a, a volunteer to help me out tomorrow morning. Who can come in? And with, without hesitation, this happens right here. You, people go to their phone, right? Some dude was in the corner, has like a New York Times open. The paper wasn't there three minutes earlier. <laughs> Say yes, because you know what? At that moment, when you decide not to say yes, when someone asks for a volunteer, I am making, or your boss is making a judgment on you. Like, are they a top performer? Are they a go-getter? Do they want to make things happen? 
When I was in New York City, when those opportunities presented themselves, I was the first one to raise my hand and say, yes, what do you need? Do I need to go to the post office for you? Do you need me to show up early? Do I need to set up chairs? What do you need? Yes, I got you. What happens when you say yes is you build up trust in yourself. You, you build up equity. You build up confidence in you. You become what, what Seth Godin comes a linchpin. You become indispensable. So when that opportunity comes next time, they're not gonna ask the whole room, hey, who can do this? They're gonna say, hey, Prentice, come with me. We're gonna do this right now, okay? So say yes every time you get the opportunity to do so. Number two, invest in you. You guys are doing that right now. You don't have to be here. You spent money to be here at Thank Iowa. Take advantage of this investment. Have your business cards, have your website, take classes, continue to learn. And it's not always a matter of just spending dollars and cents when I say invest in you. It's developing relationships, taking time to do that. It's having informational meetings, doing those things. When I was at Nickelodeon, I wanted to be a writer, but initially I was hired to be a, a temp worker. I spent a vacation flying out to California, renting a car, spending my money to volunteer on the set of a television show because I wanted to invest in myself and it paid off. The third thing, and this is the biggest thing, which, you know, all the speakers yesterday, one thing they had consistent in their talks was focus, man. What did Jay-Z say? I'm focused, man. Finish something. Breathe life into your ideas. Choose anything, but choose something. Frankly, you know, you ever hear people say, I'm an idea guy. I don't like idea guys, because for me, ideas are useless unless you breathe ideas into them. You got an idea for a new project at work? Don't go to your boss like, hey, I got an idea. Can we do this? No? Okay, thanks. See you later. Hey, I have an idea for a new project. I've done some research. Let me show you what I got so far. Here's the opportunity in a new market. Have as much of that idea fleshed out as possible. At Nickelodeon, I wanted to be a writer. So what do writers do? They write, but I was hired to be a production assistant. I was holding cue cards and I was making coffee runs. But what did I do? Every single day I wrote. I studied great writers. I took classes at local universities in New York City and, and after I got a bit of confidence underneath me, I went up to the head writer of the show. And I said, hey man, I've been writing, I wanna to learn to write more, is it possible? Could you take a look at some of the scripts that I've been working on? He said, absolutely. Over the course of a matter of months, my, my, my writing got progressively better. And I will never forget this day, guys. I was sitting in my, in my cubicle, and he came up to me and, and he said, hey, Antonio, um, one of our writers is, is out sick. Is, do, you, do you have a, any scripts ready to go? We, we, need, we need somebody right now, do you have any scripts ready? Don't, don't ask Antonio Neves if he's ready. If he has any scripts ready, I said, hold on a second. I gave him the finger. You ever get by the finger? Hold on. <laughs> I came to him with this. I was like, yo, scripts here. Bam. Two weeks later, I was a staff writer on that show. Here's what's real, guys. All it takes is someone being out sick one day for your opportunity to present itself. The question is, will you be ready? The sad truth is that most people won't. I've witnessed it day in and day out throughout my career. Luck is when opportunity meets preparation. Will you be prepared? The challenge about this walk on mentality, I'm telling you guys, is that none of this is not sexy, man. They, they don't write about the doing the hard work in the Des Moines Register and the New York Times. They, they write about the end result. People always talk about, uh, you know, so important, you gotta commit, you gotta commit, you gotta commit. For me, the most important thing is not committing, the most important thing is recommitting. You have to recommit every single day to what's important. I used to get mad when I would see interviews and people say, what's the secret to success? You gotta work hard. Damn it, I don't wanna do that. <laughs> it is the truth. Commit, but then recommit every day. The third question, and my last question, about how you can create your own luck, and this may be the most important question you guys can ask yourselves ever, is, is who makes you better? And, I, and I'm proud to, to quote Ron there. I, you know, I interviewed Ron not too long ago for an interview, and uh, he said that, be associated with greatness. Ask yourself this question right now. Think about um, the five people you spend the most time with outside of work. The five people you spend the most time with outside of work. And be honest with yourself. Give yourself a, a quick assessment. Do they make you better? Do they make you better? Or do they make you complacent? Do they keep you where you are, standing still? Truth is, quite a few years ago, I didn't spend a lot of time with people that made me better. These weren't bad people, don't get me wrong, but these are people I'd have like casual dinners with, and I'd have drinks with, and we spent a lot of time talking about all the things that we were going to do, 
knowing that we were never going to do them. I knew I needed to change things up a little bit. I knew that I needed to be associated with greatness. So you have to identify who your thieves of ambition are and who your allies of glory are. Of glory are. I think about track and field at Western Michigan University. I remember my coach coming up to me one day at practice and he said, hey man, um, you're not doing so good. Two years in, you haven't placed in a major competition. And uh, he said, but I want to tell you something. You may not know this, but we have a couple all of Americans on our team. But I have never once, Antonio, saw you practice with the All-Americans. I never once see you go to lunch with the All-Americans. I never seen you once go to the weight room with the All-Americans. You're hanging out with the guys, go, and he pointed, he said, look, you're hanging out with those guys. I look over and everybody's laying on the high jump mat, just having a big conversation laughing, <laughs> right? Are you hanging out with the All-Americans? Or are you hanging out with the guys on the high jump mat? And those guys on the high jump mat are great guys. But did they make me better as an athlete? No, I started hanging out with All-Americans two years later, earned a scholarship, thank goodness my mother could stop paying my tuition on her credit card, and I became an all-conference triple jumper. My knees still hurt. So, you identify who your thieves and ambitions are, those, those people that frankly take energy away from you, that, that support you in mediocrity, that enable your complacency. They may be good people, but they support your mediocrity. They like the status quo, it's okay. The other opportunity you have is to figure out who your allies of glory are, those people that empower you, those people that challenge you, that support you, that absolutely test you to be the absolute best version of yourself. If you guys look around this room, there are a whole bunch of allies of glory here right now that you could take advantage of. But you gotta commit, and then you gotta recommit to spending time with these individuals because it takes work and it takes committed effort. And the big thing, guys, is, is, is don't be afraid to work with the best. Frankly, these people are gonna test your limits. They're gonna push you. They're gonna hold you accountable to do what you say you want to do, what you say you're going to do, which is a harsh reality sometimes when someone tells you like, yo, you said you wanted to do that, but you didn't do it, what's up? Other people won't say that, like, yeah, man, have another drink. <laughs> By the way, another drink for me is like four, so I've learned not to have another drink. Don't be afraid to work with the best. You know, we talked earlier about creating luck. And I like this, this quote by uh, one of our forefathers. I find the harder I work, the more luck I seem to have. That's been my situation in life to this day. Again, luck is when opportunity meets preparation, okay? Every day, to this day, I take these three steps of getting uncomfortable, a walk-on mentality, who makes me better? I do with my company, Think Action, which is less than two years old, where I'm still learning how to run a business. Even though I'm getting great results, I'm still learning how to create a business that extends beyond being a service-oriented company. You know, I have extensions of Think Action where I go work with the Bold Academy, where instead of having an incubator just for startups, the Bold Academy is an incubator for individuals so they can close their greatness gap. I have the Ignition Lab, where we're all about co-working and co-solving and supporting each other and being better. Where I'm vested in your success, you're vested in my success. I'm getting uncomfortable tomorrow and inviting 30 people to join me at Startup City for a work workshop from Think Action, excuse me, from Think Iowa to Think Action. I don't know if anyone's gonna show up, but you know what? I put it out there, I'm gonna get uncomfortable. If, it, if it's just me and another person, we're gonna have a damn good two hours together, okay? So these things I'm telling you to do, I do every single day. What I'm asking you guys to do, frankly, is be pissed off. Effort, at the end of the day, is between you and you. Effort is between you and you. The truth of the matter is, and I hate to say it, is that no one, and I mean absolutely no one, cares more about your goals than you do. Not your friends, not your girlfriends, boyfriends, parents. They may care a lot, but no one cares more about it than you. I heard a professional athlete speak too long ago, and that's where that comes from. He said, I'm pissed off. He said, I'm pissed off for greatness. Because if you're not pissed off for greatness, that means you're okay with being mediocre. And I'm confident that no one in this room, no one here at Think Iowa, because you signed up, is okay with being mediocre. 
So I challenge all of you to find a way to get uncomfortable, to have a walk on mentality, and surround yourself with those people that make you better so you can create your own luck, whether you're an entrepreneur or you work for a company or you're a college student. It's your choice, it's your opportunity. So I wanna say thank all of you guys for making me better and please let me know how I can make you better. Thank you.